Today on 21st Century Victorian, our plucky protagonist discovers they've made a terrible mistake with the Watteau bag, wonders where the Watteau bag even came from, and appliques down approximately one million tiny fabric leaves and flowers. I am currently in the process of creating a tea gown inspired by Neil Gaiman's The Sleeper in the Spindle, an 1890s version of what Sleeping Beauty may have been wearing on her ill-fated trip up into the tower to prick her finger on a spindle. If you are interested in more of the backstory on this project, I will put the link to the original video somewhere up here and down in the description. But long story short, I am applicating the flower and vine motif from the book onto my tea gown. In making my tea gown, I started out as any good sewist would and followed the instructions in the pattern. My initial plan was to assemble the front and back up to the point where they're joined together. Then do my thread painting and applique and join them like you would any other garment. However, I did not think through the difficulties of appliquing and thread painting on the back of the pleat. One of the first steps in constructing this tea gown is sewing the tube of fabric and attaching it to the gown to create the Watteau pleat. The Watteau, or Watteau pleat as it is often called, is that long tube of fabric and it's attached at the collar and then left free until it attaches again at the waist. These are also called sack backs because they are based on 18th century sack back gowns. Now we more commonly call this a robe à la française or a sack gown. Interestingly, the term Watteau pleat does not actually come into vogue until the 19th century when the style made a comeback. They were named after Jean Antoine Watteau, a painter from the late 16 and early 1700s who featured sack back gowns prominently in his work. So I happily attached my pieces at the waist seam, sewed all the back pieces together, and dutifully finished all the seams to prevent the silk from fraying like that was its job. The next step was to attach the collar, which would have effectively closed the Watteau pleat. Like the extravagant court gowns of the 18th century and the stately afternoon wear of the 19th century, I wanted the Watteau to hang free which meant not appliquing or thread painting through both Watteau layers and the gown back. That's what I would have had to do if I'd closed the collar. So I stopped here and began basting my vines on. And basting. And basting. And basting. For the vines, I used the gold quilter's cotton from Michael Miller's Fairy Frost line. To make the vines, I cut bias tape, sewed the pieces end to end to end to end to end to end, then ran them through my bias tape maker. This gave me a flexible strip with the raw edges turned under that I could curve along the back. I basted the tape in place by hand to make sure the turned edges stayed under. Then I took it to the machine and realized my unfortunate mistake. Appliquing the vines and leaves and flowers on meant that I needed to pull the Watteau onto my machine like this and very carefully make sure I didn't do anything like sew the gown to itself or pull and stretch it so much that I ruined the garment. And since the leaves and flowers require a ton of turning and sewing from different angles, this would be no small feat. To accomplish this for the leaves, I first cut the leaves out using my Cricut and Steam a Seam 2. Steam a Seam is an iron-on fusible web that can be used to bond fabrics and stabilize appliques. I did make a crucial mistake here, maybe you've already seen it, in that steam a seam needs, well, steam to bond. And silk and steam are not friends. However, since the steam a seam is tacky and I was sewing over it, I was able to get away with not actually steaming it. I did do a sample piece using steam and found that it really didn't harm the silk if I was quick. So if I have to do it, I do have that option. I then placed the leaves where I wanted them and started sewing down from the bottom of the leaf around the outside to applique it. After that, I created a middle vein with radiating smaller veins coming out of it in the same way we draw leaves. This involves sewing a line, rotating the fabric around 180 degrees, and, and sewing back along the same line until you get to where you want the veins to split, and then rotating the piece again. Sew the new line out to where you want it, then rotate again. Trace that line back until you reach your first line. Repeat this process until you are satisfied with your leaf. Then moved on to the next one, and the one after that, and so forth and so on into eternity. I really love thread painting since I think it can bring a motif to life if done well. Different kinds of thread painting exist, and every thread painter has their own technique. 
but my goal for this piece was to create some contrast and pop and give some depth to the vines. One of the nice things about thread painting is that you are going for overall effect, so individual details don't really matter. The leaves don't have to be perfectly balanced, and it's okay if your lines are wonky. By the time I got to the flowers, which were the black quilter's cotton from Michael Miller's Fairy Frost line, I got fed up and decided it would just be easier to unpick the Watto pleat seam. I wish I had done this from the beginning, but oh well. For the flowers, I sewed around the outside of the petals, then created small lines in the center for some depth. I really loved this effect, which is good because it took a heckin' long time to do. While sewing leaves and flowers down, I got curious about why the Watto pleat made a comeback in the late 1800s. Some of this relates to the Japanese move fad sweeping over Europe, something I plan to talk about more in my tea gown reveal video once I have sewn down my million flowers and leaves. But it also seems that there was a larger revival and thirst for historicism, which prompted the reintroduction of both recent European fashions and also the classical styles from the ancient world. Against the backdrop of industrialization and a burgeoning middle class, the Victorians felt they were incredibly modern and sophisticated. And what better way to show that than by drawing on what they felt was a rich heritage of beauty and art. Part of my motivation in choosing a tea gown for this project was also the influences of the Art Nouveau movement on fashion at the time. Looking through collections of extant pieces, many have applique and embroidery creating elaborate designs. This is especially true of those most heavily influenced by the influx of Japanese art and textiles. So, in the best traditions of the tea gown, this piece mixes my newer modern approaches with classical dress of a previous era. At this point, I have finished the motif on most of the Watto pleat and sewn it back together. My next steps are to attach the collar and continue assembly. I keep positing the order in which I am going to assemble the pieces and then being dead wrong. Since that keeps changing, I will not speculate further here. We'll just see what happens and maybe I'll even be as surprised as you in the end. In the meantime, I will bid you adieu and return back to my miles of applique. With that, I remain as ever your faithful servant and 21st century Victorian, Francis Worthington. Mm -hmm.